folks, welcome back inside the Parisi Palace, high above 2919 East Broadway. This is the Jake Feinberg Show. Coming to you live on powertalk.live. Please go to our website, powertalk.live. Download the free app to your smartphone and stream all of our live local shows worldwide. We are full-on extraterrestrial radio, and we thank you for being making us part of your day today. And uh, my next guest is... Um, a guy who's been uh, improvising melodically uh, for decades, uh, really cutting his teeth with uh, the most traditional blues and Dixieland jam band style, playing left-hand trombone. He had his own octet uh, for a long time, and he's played with the heaviest cats in the world. Spent a long time in Europe as well, which is not uncommon for the African-American musician here in the United States. He's also been a teacher at Harvard University, among others, and uh, he's continuing to collaborate and teach, as he will, at the Chicago Institute of Jazz uh, on July 19th. Slide Hampton, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Thank you, Jake. How are you, my man? I'm glad to talk to you. I was just listening to Art Tatum and Ben Webster just before you called. <laughs> That's just fantastic, man. Had some great sessions here on television. From forty uh, to four hundred and forty up or musical channels. Right, right. You know, slide. Um, can you talk? I mean, can do you? Did you play um, Dixieland music? Well, we came along at a time when most of the music was Dixieland. That's when I started. Can you, you know? It wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't. Uh, it, when I was young, you know, that's when they gave me the forced me to play the trombone. And the style of music that everybody played then was pretty much Dixieland. That was in 1932. 1932. So, you, I mean, it was Dixieland and then, but knowing that you came from a very musical family and that you obviously have African roots, how did you, um, when was the first time you heard the, the African rhythms meshing up with Dixieland to kind of form uh, swing jazz, or you take us through that evolution because uh, this is just important. In, in my mind, I feel a lot of cats today, a lot of musicians, um, that in 2016, they're not really going back far enough in history to, to know where the roots of the music. And so I just that's wanted, very true. wanted you to break that down. Okay, that, that's one thing that I like to tell all the kids whenever I do a class now, how far back you have to go to learn what will help you to go further ahead. And see, I was raised in Indianapolis, and there were a lot of musicians there. And they are the ones that helped to change music from the Dixieland style to straight-ahead jazz. And the big bands were traveling throughout the country, so the, the agents, the, the booking agents were in Indianapolis, so everybody came to Indianapolis to get their contracts, so often they played there. So I got to hear all the bands because of that and got to play with some of them. In fact, I was offered a job with the Sweethearts of Rhythm, and they wanted me and my brother to go with them and wanted us to put dresses on, and we were going to do it. But my mother wouldn't let us go. They wanted you to dress up as women? They wanted they wanted to do it because it's a, a ladies' band, you know. Why? I would have done that. <laughs> I was going to do it, yeah. We, we, we sat in with them, and we, the band was very good, and we, we were going to go with them. But Mom said, no, you still got to stay here and go to school and do all that stuff. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I'm curious about the idea. Did you get offers to go on the road when you were still considered a minor? No, no, it was a family van. We were traveling with the family van. So we played all kind of whatever kind of jobs that were available to us, often in circuses and things like that. And, and I guess some political kind of affairs. So I, I stayed with the band until I was up in age before I tried to go anywhere else. Can you talk about the first gig that you were offered? Out, the, I mean, it's fascinating to me that you were in a family band playing all sorts of, I guess, local. I mean, were you traveling all over the country, or were you just basically doing Midwest stuff? No, we were traveling a lot. Wow. But I, the first job I was offered outside of the band was with Miles Davis in Cincinnati, Ohio. He was traveling around as a soloist, and the, the, one of the jobs that we that he put a band together to play with him, I was in the band. He was very kind to me. I wasn't playing very good, but he 
inspired me by telling me that I, I would be good. Okay, so let's break this down. You, why were you, you, were, you, he, you got a call to come down there, or you just happened to be in Cincinnati? I just happened to be there. I was trying to go to New York. So Cincinnati was 100 miles closer to New York than Indianapolis is. Mm -hmm. So I went there, and I prayed with Miles, and then a friend of mine that was in Houston, Texas, had a band there, told me to come to Houston. So I went from Cincinnati to Houston, and I stayed there for a year playing with his band. Buddy Hiles. Um, I want you to explore. I, this is a, you're you're going to be d doing a seminar at the Chicago Institute of Jazz. Um, yes. I, I want you to talk about this. is so important because my show is is about promotion. It it really is not about preservation. But I want you to explain to the audience around the world right now how by going back to bebop to swing to Dixieland will help you move forward. I think a lot of people, there's anxiety today. There's not as many places to play. The venues have shortened. Uh, we don't really have a record industry anymore. So there's anxiety, and people feel this need to have, to basically show their technical chops, but they don't know the roots of the music. And I want you to talk about how, how important it is to go as far back as possible, and that will help springboard you into you know, future time. Well, that's what I'm going to. That's what I'm going to talk to the students about. Is that there's a lot of things that went on before us that we don't really know about the, the level of the quality of the musicians. See, but there were some musicians in every period that really loved music, and they were they had developed to a very high level of whatever it takes to be a, an improviser. And if you go back, you'll find you'll learn some things that you don't you didn't you don't know exist. But those are things that give you a foundation to go on to wherever you're trying to go you have to go back to the music that came before you that's what all music is you have to learn about the music that came before you that's reason it was there so you could learn about music can and you then from that point yeah. you go on to something else can you give an example in your own career that would lend credence to this theory that where you 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 discovered someone that from another time that, that a lot of guys yeah i discovered and you know a lot of it i discovered on this program that i told you about because they play the music all the way back from all the you know there were a lot of great trombone players that some of them became band leaders some of them people don't know about but there were a lot of great trombone players that if you had the opportunity to hear from what they were doing it inspired you to become the best that you could become can you give an example yeah well you know it was all the way back to tommy dorsey and and uh, the fellow that was part Indian, was, he played with Louis Armstrong. Mm, I mean, Jackie, Jackie, uh, I can't think of his last name, but I will think of it as we go on. So we go back and hear those guys, and they give you more to go ahead on where you're going to go. Although you don't have to play like them, but you have to learn from them. Did you, uh, did you cross paths with Jack Teagarden at all? Jack Teagarden. That's who I was talking about. Jack, are you calling him Jack, Jack Teagarden? So talk about Jack Teagarden. I mean, explain what he was doing that was that was inspiring to you. Well, he was one of the improvisers, you know, one of the guys that improvised on trombone. And often in bands, they didn't let the trombone players do a lot of improvising. Interesting. They just made them play the music. But there were guys that were able to really improvise. So if you had a chance to hear them and get them in a situation where they were improvising, you learned from them. It's all us learning from each other, learning from the people that came before us. Is without a question, it has to be that way. Would you consider that? Uh, would you consider T. Garden to be the first cat that was able to actually, because he was a band leader, he he was the first one to improvise on the trombone. No, there were some other guys, some guys that weren't that really aren't not well known. That you know, of course, inspired Jack also. But he was. Some guys have the ability to be inspired and hear a person doing something that they don't do, and it inspires them to start to develop the ability to do that. You see, and Jack is one of those guys. And after he heard somebody, because improvisation started back with Johann Sebastian Bach. Sure. You know, so and and then it stopped because the people that were writing classical music they wouldn't let them improvise. They made them write everything. But improvisation had already started, and there were a lot of guys that were good improvisers, but nobody heard about them. And you never heard about them, but there's some write-ups in them in some, in some of the books and things. 
you know, talking to Slide Hampton here, legendary character and just an amazing trombone player. Um, so, I mean, can you talk to younger cats who are rolling their eyes and listening, saying, okay, I hear what they're saying about not being, you know, they're not interested in reading stuff off charts. They want to improvise. Um, is it merely trial and error? How did you get comfortable improvising in a melodic fashion? Was it just being on the bandstand six or seven nights a week? Explain to the world how to, be, once you get your chops down, how to feel the music so it can start coming through you. Well, one of the things that happens that's very important for all of us, everybody has to learn to play the piano. Right on. Because all music that was composed was coming from keyboard players, not from trombone players or trumpet players. So when you learn that, it gives you a, another foundation to start to find out how to develop your melodies and lines and the harmony that's going on in the composition. It's very, you know, it's very uh, simple, actually, to understand that you have to learn the piano and from that. You know, if you haven't improvised before, you know, you, then you listen to whoever you think is improvised and try to see what they're doing. And give you, like Dizzy used to tell me, don't play what I play, but I hope that what I play inspires you to try to find something of your own to play. Wow, that is, I love Dizzy. So, so how long did it, how hard was that for you to do? Hard, it was hard. <laughs> My first job, I went on improvising. The guy told me, go home, go. don't come back. <laughs> but no, it's no. so interesting. Listen to me and be inspired by me, but don't play what I'm playing. Yeah. That to me is so solid, man. But I mean, can you talk? Okay, so even when those cats said, uh, don't come back, you did go back, come back. Well, that's why I went home for a couple of years and practiced and played some of the changes right because <laughs> I wasn't playing the changes and there are guys uh, the guy's name was Earl Grandy he taught all of us hmm. he played piano and he played great and he wrote great and everything and he told me slide you're not playing none of the changes go home and practice changes and don't come back until you learn to play some of them and it was a shock of course but you know it was a good thing well absolutely I, can you can you tell me a, cla a classic Freddie Hubbard story? Well, you know, I was, uh, of course, uh, I was born before Freddie, but I didn't get to know Freddie until I left Indianapolis. Really? That, I, cause I, I, I just assumed that he maybe was just some young guy chomping at your ankles uh, in Indy, but no, you met him in New York or something? I met him in, yeah, in New York or somewhere. You know, but the guy that I... Learned a lot from in Indian. I was caught first with J.J. J. Johnson. Oh, yeah. It was the first guy. I was at standing in near a club one day, and I couldn't go in because I was too young. And J.J. J. came, so he said, I want to go in and play, so give me your horn. So I, he took my horn in and played it. <laughs> and I was looking in the bell trying to say, how does, the, how, how does the horn sound like that with you? <laughs> right. And it didn't sound anything <laughs> like that with me. <laughs> What was he, what made him? Because you know he's one of these. guys. I mean, you're you're crediting him as as a forefather of, of the bone. Um, talk about JJ. Just what what was uh, what was uh, seminal about his playing, and that makes him relevant today as a trombone player. I think that somehow you know we've all tried to find out where he did his study, and that gave the basic of playing the trombone the way he did. He won't tell anybody, and we don't know who it is. <laughs> So I know one thing about it, he loved to learn to play the trombone, so he worked on it, you know. And it's where he learned, it's one of those things where you know that you can't play it unless you do the work. And that's what he, he did the work. So he was playing, and he was playing with the saxophone players and all that, playing the same thing that they were, playing more than they played, because he did that kind of work that it takes to, to because the trombone is not easy. That's one of the great things about it. And he used to say the trombone will, will really intimidate you every time you play it. Mm. And that's true, but he worked on it and got to the place that he was. I did. I went to a lot of the sessions that he did in the end of his life, and he would play perfect from the warm-up through the whole session every time. Never miss anything for the whole time. It was incredible. And it was still burning, though. He was still playing, yeah, playing as much as he wanted to, as high as he wanted to. And they tell me, I'm going to play a high F tonight. 
<laughs> the Irving Green, those guys played high S all the time. That was nothing for them. But JJ never played. You know, he never played over a D. Not I'm playing a high F. But I want to go back. Learning the piano means you can be in tune with every every scale, every note of every scale. You can learn that. Yeah, it's all on. It's all on the piano. You really see it much better on the piano than you do trying to imagine in your mind those scales on your horn. Did They're you? All right yeah. In front of you. This is so interesting. This is just absolutely fascinating. So, I, I, going back, tell me about. Uh, meeting Freddie and, 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 and give me a good story about Freddie Hubbard. Well, you know, by the time I fr met Freddie, uh, he was playing in my octet. And he was playing with Booker Little. And Booker Little was the guy that practiced 10 hours a day. He had Freddie up so upset every night that Freddie was almost crying. Wow. And Freddie learned from him, and because of playing there with Booker, he became the best that he could be. Somehow he uh, he got he got to a high level of playing. I don't know how he got there, you know, but he he took the trumpet to another level altogether, you know. How was he to work with as a leader, though? He he he. Uh, what was he like at that time as a person? Well, I I got along good with him, but a lot of people probably didn't. Because I don't know why it's like I was the same way with Miles. I got along great with Miles, but a lot of people didn't get along good with him. What, what, I mean, what, what what was it about? How come you got along with them? Well, I don't know because he was, you know, he was an arrogant person, and uh, he treated me like I, I he had some respect for me for some reason. He must maybe he was drunk. I don't know. Well, I mean, I think that the point was that maybe their arrogance turned people off, but they did respect people that could play. And then if you didn't get caught up in the ego part of it, uh, you know, you wouldn't have a problem with them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I did, who can you talk, you know, as we as we move in we're, we're more than halfway through the year 2016 heading into the unknown uh a world in chaos yet somehow there is order still. Um can you talk about what you believe are the seminal qualities of leadership uh on the bandstand? Yeah, I was fortunate to work with Billy Eckstein. I worked with Dizzy. I worked with uh, Woody Herman, and the lead, the band leaders that had a respect for themselves, of course, and loved music, had that kind of band. And there were some great bands, and some of them that we haven't heard much of at all. But the band leader was the one that decided where the band was going to go, and if they had the respect for the music, they would choose the best musicians they could. They didn't choose them because they were one color or the other. They chose them because they were people that loved music and they wanted to play together with other people that loved music. And that's that's what uh, today is very important. If you want to put something together, put people together that want to play together, that respect each other and love music and want to make music together. Can you talk about uh, something that, like with Dizzy, where it was inspiring the way he led. It wasn't necessarily it was nonverbal, maybe, but it was a it was a nonverbal way of leading that inspired you. Yeah, he was very you know he was the guy that you know never real he the guy figured he didn't have to tell you anything. He said you just have to listen to what I'm playing, the way I play, and you'll know what you have to do. And he said I learned from Charlie Parker. He said Charlie Parker, when we played together, no matter how, how no matter how difficult the ensembles were. He played all the notes. He said, I played what, of them what I could. He said, I couldn't play all those things that he was playing on trumpet, but I did play what I could. He said, so when I listened to Charlie Parker, he's the one that gave me the direction of where I needed to try to go with my style of playing. Listening is very important. Slide, I mean, can you, uh, you know, you're, so do you believe, do you really believe that, that the music of, of spontaneous improvisation, melodic improvisation can grow as a language in academia. I mean, all I'm trying to say is that you might have fallen down, trial and error, get up, don't come back, you came back, you did, you practiced, obviously, but you guys played live so much. You had yeah. all this opportunity, to, and that's why you have, you know, you put on a record, you can tell who it's Slide Hampton, or you can tell it's J.J. Johnson, or you can tell it's Irby Green. Everybody had their own sound because they were very comfortable getting up in front of three people or 3,000 people. 
Re, do you yeah. really do you really think realistically that that melodic improvisation can be can grow as vocabulary can grow in academia? Well, as you as you just said, uh, you know the uh, the idea of of uh, getting up in front of any amount of people and trying to improvise on the highest level you can, you know, to make the most music because music is always the the objective of whatever you're doing. And it doesn't mean only playing high or fast. It means playing musically. And that's what we all try to do, and that's what we learn to do from Charlie Parker. Learn to do that from Louis Armstrong. When you improvise, make music. When you play with people, ch- play, play with people that are, are making music also. See, and, and music and uh, composing is always improvising. Guys w- that write the music are improvising when they compose. But then, you know, to read music is a good thing to learn because you work with people. But improvisation comes when I'm writing a, 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 a score and I write something and I see something and I say, well, no, this could be this way and go back and write that over another way. That's improvisation. Right. Um, do you feel that you, you a lot of your original compositions were actually just spinoffs of you know, the Great American Songbook. I mean, I, I don't want to overcomplicate it for people. Um, when you talk about composing and improvising and fusing the two together, how do you do it? Well, I thought about the uh, the fact that before I started trying to write, there were guys that were writing some great compositions. You know, there was Jerome Kern, there was Billy Strayhorn, there was Tad, Tad, jo- uh, Tad, Tad, Dameron, you know, all these sure. guys were writing, so you, you you can't avoid listening to them. You don't have to write like them, but you can't avoid listening to them because you just get an idea of how to develop a, a theme for a song that you're writing, and it's a great thing. for Everybody should know this, and then we all work together trying to make music better. And the better we make music, the better everything is. Talking to Slide Hampton here on the Jake Feinberg Show. You, you talked about Tea Garden. Um, when you when you look at someone like, uh, how much of an impact do you think Tea Garden had on someone like Stan Getz? Yeah, yeah, the big, the big, yeah, those guys that came before like that inspired people like Stan Getz. They inspired JJ. They inspired everybody. You know, and you, you know when people don't know how many great musicians there were, they can't. People don't know that. New York was filled with musicians that were all very in love with music. You know, and the love of music, it determines how far you're going to go in it. You know, it's not just because you want to make money or something. It's because you love the music. You love to see how you can make a melody and put the notes together to make a melody have as much musical value as possible. So then when you listen to a guy like T. Garden, you know, then it inspires you to find some way to put your notes together when you improvise. But the whole thing is always trying to be as musical as possible. That's... And it's easier if there's a lot of love in the community, right? I mean, it's it, the culture and the music was on the streets when you were coming up, right? And it's, yeah. It's, it, oh, yeah. But what, I mean, even today, like in Orange, New Jersey, or I mean, in Indianapolis, how many, what is there, the Jazz Bakery? How many clubs are really left in these in these towns? I mean, you know, North Jersey used to be a haven for, you know, great improvisational blues, you know, post-bop, jazz. I mean, what, where where are you supposed to express yourself now, Slide? Well, you know, your expression is always in the fact that you're either composing or you're teaching or you're doing something in music. And whatever you do, you teach them the same thing that you learned about having the people that came before you. See, everything... Not only in music, this is in everything. Everything came, there were people came before you doing whatever you're going to try to do. You learn from that. That's how musicians learn. From all the guys that came before them, and some of them weren't known. And, you know, a lot of the classical musicians that wrote great classical music, a lot of them died starving. People didn't see, people didn't pay them the respect until they were gone. And that happens everywhere. I know. And in jazz, it's like that. A lot of musicians that were very... Uh, very qualified, still didn't, people didn't know it after they were gone, until after they were gone. But go back because there are a lot of people that are very qualified. Did you? I, I asked you last night. Uh, um, 
I'm working on a documentary, a film documentary for uh, Stan Getz, and I was mm-hmm. wondering, I, I wanted to get your thoughts on, um, uh, I know he's played a lot with J.J., and I wanted to know about your thoughts on Stan. Yeah, he's a great player. He's a great player. He came from a lot of great saxophone players, obviously. All the saxophone players that learned from all the guys that came before them became very good. Because the saxophone, you know, after starting with the man in France, and then when the guys in America started getting hold of the saxophone, there were a lot of great players. And some of them, you know, you know, you never really hear. They only record a little bit. Some of them, but they recorded, and everybody that came after them had the opportunity to become as much as they wanted to become, just by having the appreciation for the quality of those guys that played before. Them. Sure, but but Stan in particular, what what is your perspective on his legacy? Well, he, he, he the one thing that he did that's very important for everybody. He used a saxophone and a mouthpiece that got a beautiful sound. You know, and that's what everybody's find something that plays very natural for you. That's the first thing you have to do: find a mouthpiece that works very good for you, and then do all the thousands of hours of work on that. And then forming your, changing your oral, your mouth, so that you can form the notes? Yeah, well, it's, you know, it's, it's like actually when you find something that doesn't cause you to make too much of a stress, stress effort to do it, you know, you don't do a lot of turning your mouth around and everything. You just put your mouthpiece on your armature on your mouth and just blow in it and the sound comes out. Right. Yeah. Did you get to see Stan play with J.J. a lot? Well, I heard I heard the records. I didn't get to see him in person, but I heard the records. What I, it, I, I, yeah. I would, I would I play this one job with Stan in Switzerland, and uh, it was Dexter and Stan, Benny Bailey, and myself. And of course, you know, he always played with a beautiful sound. And actually, you can learn when you hear a guy like that. You can learn yourself when you hear that, because you wouldn't know that it was possible if you didn't hear somebody do it. Right, and it was his. It was his tone, also. But I think what we've been talking about here, this. I mean, I've been reading quotes from him, just talking about the essence of jazz is just totally spontaneous music. I mean, he didn't rehearse. Did you guys like for that gig? Did you do much rehearsing for it um, in Switzerland? No, in fact, our drummer didn't show up, <laughs> so we had a drummer to come along, Billy Brooks. He's from here. Yeah. And he played the whole show without having heard or seen the music we were playing. He played like he had, played like he had rehearsed it. So it was uh, Dexter, you, Stan, Billy, Billy Brooks. Who else? Billy Brooks, and let's see who else. I think maybe Benny Bailey might have. I think it was Benny Bailey, and it was it was. Uh, we finally had the, the group as big as the one that they did on the Sophisticated Giant thing. Sure. We did some of that. Um, before I let you go slide, um, I wanted to just, um, ask you, you know, for younger cats, you, we keep talking about going back and, and, and in this case, um, you know, uh, the, the, the touring circuit, uh, does not exist the way it did before. And so, I mean, how effective is it to just listen to records? I mean, ultimately you learned from Dizzy on the bandstand. You learned mm-hmm. from cats uh, on the bandstand, all right? Younger cats yeah. today, they they can go back. I mean, it's all well and good to know your history and like to, to hear that improvisation and be inspired, but it's ultimately about making music as a, a communal thing. And I'm just trying to get your perspective on how people are supposed to circumvent that in 2016. How, how are you supposed, beyond records, without the touring circuit, how are you supposed to just be able to know your history? Yeah, yeah, that's very important. And the thing is that it's not it's not as impossible as it would seem to be. Mm-hmm. See, the uh, the thing is your love for music and the environment that you grew up in, the environment that's around you, the other musicians that are around you. If you got the good music, musicians around you that are really into learning what you, you know, the same kind of thing about improvisation that you do, then it's a benefit to you. If you, if you, if you, if you know, you get, but you, you know, you got to get all the information that really helps you. The idea of reading music 
is an important thing because a lot of things that you're going to learn, you learn from reading. And then, of course, and see, I wish I'd had all these records and things when I was coming up. Yeah, but I think, know, it, I, th I think in some ways, I think in some ways, we're saturated with material now. And for yeah. you, for you, you had to go out and actually get in it, you know. Yeah. And uh, and now there's almost too much, and it's all accessible. And there's a huge history of music. And then you're supposed to ask for new vocabulary. Um, tell me one goal that you're looking to accomplish. Or that one thing you would like to happen as a catalyst for this upcoming um, seminar that you're doing in Chicago? Well, I want to help the guys to realize that although there's a lot of material out there to listen to, listen to all of it. Because you don't know what part of it is going to be the thing that really inspires you, your imagination. So listen to all of it. And whenever you get a chance to go around where somebody's actually playing, do it. But, you know, the, the right now, the, you know, you don't have all that opportunity to play with everybody. And I didn't play with everybody either. <laughs> but I had a chance to play with some guys. See, I was in Woody's band. And the thing I remember when I was in Woody's band, I remember the guy that I heard on the recording with Woody, which was Bill Harris. It was always a big inspiration to me, see. So if you hear, you know, if you, you can hear something from a record that will inspire you to actually extend your imagination into music as far as possible. Would you encourage people to listen to electronic music with the drum track and non-human music, or even, even that? Because to me, that constricts the ability for real improvisation. Well, it, it is different anyway, but it, I, I listened to some just in the last couple of days. Yeah. And some of the rhythm stuff that they have on there, is very interesting. In fact, the rhythm, some of the rhythm stuff they have is coming from the other style of music, coming from the bebop and from the other style of music. But when they play it over and over exactly the way it is so people can dance to it, you might not realize that, but that's coming from drummers that played before that didn't play that style. And, and these they, are... A, yeah, it's interesting. I like, the, I like the idea of of having... You know, I noticed that in all of the... Uh, music from the, the uh, Spanish music and some of the other music. They put the, the pop beats behind the music. Um, these are, um, but they're, they're actually just, just, just uh, uh, taking beats and, 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 and mixing them in. These aren't real people playing the rhythms. Right. Is that right? Uh, some of it is, yeah. Some of it is by things that have been recorded already or something like that, and they use it. But, it, you know, everything has a... Everything has a, can, can be inspire you in some way. You know, although it's a different thing than what you're going to do, it can, you can be inspired by it. So you can't really, one thing is don't find anything, uh, don't be negative about anything. Be positive about everything and learn everywhere you can, everything that you can. And you end up being something completely different than a lot of the stuff that you're listening to. I dig, and uh, that's why you're still here and still providing a lot of enthusiasm and love for, and continuing that lineage of music. Uh, Slide Hampton, my man, great to connect with you, brother. Uh, we'll be in touch and uh, have a have a good trip to Indianapolis, and uh, all the best to you, my man. I enjoyed this very much. Thank you. All right, be good. We'll be right back on the Jake Feinberg Show.